Sorry to stop all those conversations, but good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning everyone. Welcome to Williams. Um, grab on to those bulletins. Look on with me. If you're visiting this morning, you could look at the end of your pew. There's going to be a little sheet of paper with a couple of questions for you to fill out. So we could have a record of your visit, and then you can put in the offering plate, and we'll take it from there. Um, before... I get into the announcements. The handsome Lamar has an announcement to make about what's going on after the service this morning. So, Lamar. I like Nikki. <laughs> Just wanted to briefly make you aware at the, uh, most of you know we'll have deacon elections today. So, at the end of uh, Bob's sermon, after the benediction, if you'll just remain seated, <coughs> we'll call a brief uh, business session. Uh, the ushers will uh, come forward and pass out ballots to all members, uh, and then we will, uh, you'll mark your ballots, and then uh, the ushers will come back and collect the ballots, and then we'll be dismissed. But uh, just want to make you aware of that, so at the end of the service, just uh, be patient if you're visiting with us. We ask your patience just a few minutes. This won't take very long at all, and then the uh, outcome of the uh, elections will be communicated at the next uh, uh, church gathering. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Lamar. Um, all right, I hope you have those bulletins open. You can see that we will not have evening worship tonight. So you can spend that time with your family. Um, uh, know that you need to come back this Wednesday. Uh, starting at 5.30, we will have supper. And if you look on the back of the bulletin, you will see the menu there and all the details if you don't have your name on the list. Then at 6.30, we will have our Bible study and youth and children's activities. Um, also, you can see there's a little right up there. Uh, there's some important things going on two weeks from now here at our church. The 24th, which will be a Thursday, uh, that evening at 7.45, our school, Pleasant Valley High School, will have their homecoming bonfire out in our yard. They need a place to host that, and they thought of Williams, and we said, come on. So we're going to have a big old fire out there, and we want y'all to come and enjoy the fellowship with them and to bring some snacks if you'd like. Um, stuff to do some s'mores with would be great. The kids mentioned that. Um, but just come and be there that night and hang out with them and support them. Um, that will be that Thursday the 24th at 7.45. And then that Friday night, as you can see, there's some volunteers needed. If you are not busy that uh, evening, there's a game, a homecoming game that night at home, and the parents would like to see the game instead of working in the concession stand. So if any of y'all have some experience in that and want to volunteer, please see Stacy Bonds, or you can see me. And then right after the service this morning, I would like to meet with all my youth parents just really fast. You know how my meetings go. They're not long. We'll just meet up here in the front real we'll, real quick. All right. Um, I've done enough talking for this morning. So we will first start our service off with a word of prayer and then we'll get some hugs in. Okay. So if you would please pray with me. Precious Lord, we thank you. What a beautiful day you've given us. The sunshine and the crisp fall air is here. We thank you for this place and this time to come and worship and praise you. And we pray that you bless the words we hear, the songs that we sing, and all that takes place this morning, may it be a blessing. In your name we pray, amen. So now, find someone to love on, go.
Our scripture call to worship is Psalms 98, 1 through 6. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Good morning. If you will, uh, take a hymn this morning and turn to hymn 295. Revive us again. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth stanzas. Just stand as we sing. Our next hymn this morning is hymn 300, I'll Tell the World That I'm a Christian, and we'll sing both stanzas.
Thank you. You can be seated. You guys, oh, well, then you guys come up here then. Come up closer. Come on. Maybe I should sit on the floor. No. Should I sit on the floor? No. All right. Well, you know what, you know what this picture is of, don't you? Candy lemons. corn. See? Lemons. It's that, lemons? Candy corn. <laughs> it's that time of year for candy. It's not really. It's not that time of year for candy corn yet, by the way. It's too early. But there's candy corn everywhere. So we're going to talk a little bit with candy corn today. So we have a Bible verse that we're going to talk about, and it's Proverbs 3, 5 Lemons. through 6. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. So that really what it says is, it says, trust in the Lord and listen to the Lord, and the Lord will help you know which way to go and what decisions to make because sometimes it's hard sit down i'll tell you why we're talking <laughs> about candy corn because sometimes it's hard to make the right decisions even though it seems like it's very straightforward sometimes what's right and wrong sometimes something that seems like it's good for you isn't because if you look at look at these things i mean we've got these little these little things in here candy they're corn right like, it's good for you, isn't it? Corn's good for you, right? Except, are these good for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> the, what are they really? Candy. They're candy. They're shaped like corn, something that's good for you, but they're really candy. And, and candy's not, you know, you can eat a little candy and it not be a horrible thing. Some things are allowed, like candy. Most of us are allowed to have some candy. But mm, sometimes it's not the best idea to yeah. have everything that we're allowed to do all the time as much as we want. Candy corn. So we have to rely on listening to God for things like this. When something looks like it might be good for you, maybe it's not. So it's always a good idea to pray and to ask God, maybe, is this a good idea or not? Or you can ask your mom and dad, or you can ask your Sunday school teacher, or you can read the Bible and see if there's any, any lessons in there that would help you make a decision to see whether it's a good decision for you right then or not. So that's what we learned this morning. Sometimes the things that we're allowed to do, we don't necessarily need to do, and it's good to ask God what the things are that we should do. You have a candy corn because it's a lesson, <laughs> and I'm going to give you some. Yay! So, <laughs> everybody gets a very, very small, you're welcome parents, everyone gets a very, very small bag of candy, even you. <laughs> Our offertory hymn this morning is hymn 373, where he leads me. We'll sing uh, the first, second, all three stanzas. First, second, third. There's only three.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much this morning, Lord, for each one that is here and just the, the opportunity to come and worship and be with uh, friends and family. And Lord, just thank you so much for the way you've materially blessed us, Lord. Just help us to uh, realize how good we have it, Lord, compared to, to others in the world materially, Lord. But most of all, just thank you, thank you Lord, for your, your grace and uh, the opportunity to know about your grace, Lord, and to know about you. Just pray that you would be with us. Uh, offer that is given this morning and be with us for the rest of our service. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. stand for the doxology.
It's always a blessing to me to be at Williams, and I am particularly happy to be here today for the reason that your pastor is out of the pulpit. I'm so happy for them, and I know you are, and you look forward to their return. Our scripture today is from the eighth chapter of Mark's gospel, beginning with verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is God's word for this day. This passage occurs in some form in more than one of the Gospels. Most of us will be very familiar with it. It should speak loudly to us about what it means to be a Christian. As the scene opens, Jesus and the twelve are on the road. We are told they were visiting the villages around Caesarea Philippi. Now, this means they were in Gentile territory. No good Jew wanted to travel through Gentile territory, but this is the sign that Jesus is Savior of all the world. The disciples were used to Jesus dialoguing with them and teaching them as they walked along, but suddenly he pops a question to them. Who do people say that I am? If this has caught the disciples off guard, it's not reflected here. Some say you're John the Baptist, they reply. Since John was already dead, this would reflect a belief in reincarnation. Others say you're Elijah. The prophet Elijah was to return and prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. Still others say you are one of the prophets. Jesus weighs all of these answers and then asks one further question, the eternal question. Who do you say I am? It was true in that day and it is true today that each of us must answer for himself or herself, who is Jesus to you? Have you answered that question? Let's see what unfolds as the disciples answer that eternal question and let's apply it to our lives. Of course, to no one's surprise, Peter is first up with the answer to the question, why you are the Christ, the Messiah, he boldly answers. Strangely enough, Jesus quietly recognizes Peter's correct answer, but then says, don't tell anyone that. This is the reflection of what scholars call the messianic secret. How strange. If he is indeed Messiah, people will turn to him and he will establish the long-awaited kingdom. So why not boldly proclaim the good news? Jesus knew that people were and would follow him because they were being healed and fed and not for any spiritual reason. So the kingdom for which they were hoping was not God's kingdom. Therefore, he needed to make it clear to them what it meant that he was Messiah. 
Jesus began to teach again, and to them it's not a pretty picture. He is going to be rejected by the various religious leaders who should be supporting him and following his teachings. He is actually to be put to death. What do you want to bet that their hearing of his teachings stopped right there? They probably never heard the part about rising again on the third day. Once again, Peter, who always has an opinion and who seems to be the leader of the group, jumps in. He calls Jesus aside and reads him the riot act. Lord, why would you say such things? Don't you know we would never allow something like that to happen? Let us pause here to recognize that Peter portrays clearly the human condition. We want to believe that everything should go our way. We don't want to believe we cannot control our situation. Jesus recognizes that this attitude can be a faithful, fatal flaw for his followers. So right before the other disciples, Jesus calls Peter to task. It must have been something like, Peter, what is the matter with you? Just a little while ago, you recognized me for who I am. Now you are speaking with the very voice of Satan to deny the work of Messiah. <clears throat> he sums it up saying, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. We too must be very careful to be sure that we are not trying to blame our plans and our ideas on God. It is so easy to say, God, I have an answer to this problem, and I know you won't mind if I follow it through. Just ask you to bless me as I do. The human condition, making our plans and then asking God to bless them, is too common. And it's the worst mistake we can make. Once again, the eternal question must be answered, who do you say I am? If we believe he is who we say he is, we will be seeking his direction instead of our own. At this point, a crowd has gathered, which was not unusual when Jesus was teaching. So Jesus seems to decide to combat these mistaken ideas by making it plain what it means to be his follower. If you really want to be my followers, if you are looking for what you can give rather than what you can get, there are some things you must do. In other words, if you answer the eternal question right, it will change your life. First, you must deny yourself. That's not a very popular way to seek to enlist followers, is it? The way we are taught to live our life is to look out for old number one. The thought of denying ourselves for others, even the Lord, seldom crosses our mind. We want the best life has to offer and will do almost anything to get it. But if we are to follow Jesus, here is the matter of priority. Many years ago, I had an interesting experience. I was at Ridgecrest for student week. In the bookstore, I saw a book I really wanted, but my funds were somewhat limited as so often happens. We were also taking up a very important mission offering at that meeting. It was a choice for me, the book or the offering. I finally chose to give the money to the mission offering. After that was done, I got notice from the office that I was due a refund for something. When I went to get my refund, I found it was enough to buy the book. Now, I'm not saying that God will always work things out that way, but I am saying that if we deny ourselves in favor of God's will, it will work out to our benefit somewhere along the way. The second step then, Jesus says, is to take up your cross. If you think denying yourself is unpopular, look at this one. Generally, we see the cross in a very negative light. It is a symbol of torture and death. But if we are following Jesus, the cross becomes God's eternal plus sign. Without the cross, 
where would we be? Then to take up our cross means the same thing to us that it did to Jesus, to follow the will of God wherever it leads. Remember, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Certainly the joy was not in that terrible suffering. Jesus was no masochist. The joy was in knowing that he was doing the will of the Father. We should see the cross as the symbol of doing God's will, whatever the price, and finding joy in the doing. It is also no insignificant matter that when we look at the cross, we see that it's empty. Jesus is the victor, and we can walk with him as we carry our cross. Jesus' third instruction then is follow me. God has a plan for our lives, every one of us. Jesus leads the way to follow that plan. If we truly believe in Jesus, our responsibility is to follow him wherever he leads. That may not be where we have planned, but it is the right path. So we forget our own selfish desires, we take up our cross, and we joyfully follow Jesus. So let us then sum up what Jesus is saying to us. First, we must recognize Jesus for who he is. Have you said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of God? Second, we step out accepting his guidance in our lives. Wherever he leads, I'll follow. There is no better way. Third, we are to be faithful to his service. It is one thing to make a commitment. It is another thing to follow through. It is our responsibility to be faithful to our commitment. And fourth, we are to proudly bear his name. This may be the hardest part. Once we have committed our lives to him, people have certain expectations of us. We are to lift high the cross of Christ. This means to live our lives in a way that reflects him and calls others to him. Something has happened in recent days, and I've prayed over whether even to mention this, but I think it fits in here. Most of you kept up with the story of the woman in Kentucky who wouldn't issue the marriage licenses. And you noticed that uh, as she got out, there was a great big pep rally, and even a couple of the Republican presidential candidates showed up, not because they supported her necessarily, because it looked good. But now that woman said that she was an apostolic Christian, whatever that is, and that that was the reason that she couldn't do that. She, her life wouldn't allow her to do that. Has anybody told you that the woman has been married four times and that she had twins by her third husband while still married to her second husband? Now I have some problem with following her commitment for that reason. Now, what I'm saying is, the eternal question is, who do you say I am? And once you make a commitment and say, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, then you are committing yourself in every area of life to live that out and to be one who carries the cross of Christ. What is your answer to the eternal question. Let us pray. Great God, our Father, we thank you for what you did in Jesus. We know our lives could never be the same if we have not answered that eternal question. And we pray for anyone here today who has never made that commitment to Jesus. And we pray, Lord, for each of us that we may live out that commitment. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are here and you have not answered that eternal question and given your life to Jesus Christ, that is life's most important decision. And we urge you this morning to make that commitment. 
or if there is some other commitment that you need to make, renewing your vows to the Lord or uniting with this church or anything else, we invite you to come as we stand together and sing hymn number 376. Three seventy six, please stand as we sing. be seated please for the special business meeting. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.